Okay, if we've got our Bibles out, we can get those out to the book of Daniel. We've been in Daniel for the last little over a month. And as you're getting there, I want to remind you that uh, we will be taking communion today. Communion is central just to the church. It's just our way of not forgetting to remember. We don't want to forget to remember. Jesus said, remember me. And so what we're going to do as my message is coming to a close is... We can try to bring that to a point where we're remembering Jesus. And he gave us just such simple emblems to remember him, right? His death on the cross to rescue us. So a little bit of bread to remember his body, a little bit of juice to remember his blood. We just want to make sure we don't forget to remember. If you haven't been with us for the last several weeks, we've been preaching a series called There is a God in Babylon. And what we've been doing is, is looking at God's power and God's control when it seems like everything is flying apart, because that's what Daniel and his companions must have been feeling. The situation, the historical situation, if you aren't aware of it, is basically God has used the world superpower, Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, just the king of kings in the ancient world, the one who had the most earthly power delegated to him. God actually used him to punish his people because they were unfaithful to him. And he promised him that they, he would do that. So he actually used Babylon to drag his people out of the promised land, across the Fertile Crescent, back to Babylon, to drag them into exile for the better part of 70 years, until he would, by God's grace, return them to the promised land when Persia took over Babylon and broke in. And we read that last week. We saw the Babylonian Empire come to an end and the rise of Cyrus and Persia and all of that. So what we're doing in the book of Daniel, just before we get into the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den, right? This is like the story from Daniel, is we need to remember that Daniel, so Daniel's 12 chapters long, and the first six of it read like a novel, and then the last half read like like a really intense uh, movie, movie series where we're going to get these apocalyptic visions that what hap- what's, what's showing up in that last half is Daniel's going to take us back and he's going to let us into the different visions God showed him through his ministry over a 60 year time frame to show us the kind of messages that he had for Daniel to give to the various rulers of the world that he was serving whether it was Babylon or Persia or whatever. So we're, we're wrapping up kind of the novel portion Next week, for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the visions that Daniel was given through his ministry uh, under Nebuchadnezzar and various rulers after him. Daniel 6 is one of the most well-written stories. It's one of the most well-crafted stories, the way that it's written with such economy and suspense. What I don't want to do for this one is read it and stop and unpack it and then read it and stop. We just have to read the story because it just uh, it packs its own punch. And there's just power in reading the word and reading the story. So what I want to do is read the story, come back and say a few little things, and, uh, and then get us to communion. Notice what it says. It says, it pleased Darius. Remember, we've had a change of world powers here. We've Babylon is no longer on the scene. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 150 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps would give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set over him set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint, or any fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever! All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king, should be cast into the den of lions. 
Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign the injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles, of Judah pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you've signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored until the sun went down to rescue him. But these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And he came near to the den of lions where Daniel was, and he cried out in a tone of anguish, the king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before the, they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke their bones to pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be, shall, shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who saves Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Are you old and set in your ways? Now, let me back up. Because I've learned that I'm not supposed to use that word. I get in trouble. The O word, right? The se let's say seasoned. Are you seasoned and set in your ways? Okay. You know, you can be young and set in your ways. What we see in Daniel, chapters 1 through 6, is when Daniel was young, remember this from Daniel 1? He was set in his ways. Daniel 1 says when they were carted off into exile, that the king set, that was the word, he set his food ration, he set his education, he set his name. But Daniel, chapter 1, verse 18, set or decided that he wouldn't eat the king's food. He had to make a decision. Do you remember this? About being loyal to the king. When Daniel was 17, 18 years old, he was set in his ways. He decided, I'm going to be loyal to God no matter what, whatever the cost. What we see in Daniel 6, and what a lot of Bible school curriculums 
show is a little inaccurate. They show a, kind of a young Daniel being thrown into the den of lions, when really he's, by most scholars' estimates, he's about 80 years old at this point. <laughs> We've seen Daniel from 20, roughly, 18 to 20, to 80. And at 80, he's still set in his ways. But it's not a harsh kind of a set. You know, when we say that, when somebody says, oh, she's just old and set in her ways, or she's just seasoned and set in her ways. You know, it's not, it's kind of a, like, usually that's not said endearingly, like, right? It's usually said fairly condescendingly. And sometimes, you know, that's not a good thing. But in Daniel, from, one to chap from chapter 1 to chapter 6, what we see is that there is a, a good side to being set in your ways, regardless of your age, regardless of how seasoned you are. What we've seen over the last six chapters is it matters. What Daniel 1 through 6 has told us is your, your primary loyalty to God matters. My primary loyalty to God matters. And we've seen time and time again, whether it's Daniel or his three friends or others, where there's this clashing of loyalties, where your primary loyalty to God is at odds with your loyalty to the king, your loyalty to country, your loyalty to worship. What we saw in Daniel 3, right? Bow down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has made. And the three just said, O oh, king, we're not going to worship the image. You throw us in the, in the fiery furnace. Our God may rescue us. He may not. He has the power to do so. That's in his hands. But we'll never worship you, right? It's this, it's this clashing of primary loyalties. We have so many freedoms in our world. It's so easy to take for granted the freedom to be able to do this. That we don't have at the level of so many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. We don't have, if you make a decision to follow Jesus, that directly sets you at odds with the powers that be. Now, obviously, to some degree, in, in our culture and in our world, you know, our culture and our world does not look kindly upon or it might show disdain toward, or whatever, but it still creates space for, to some degree, to a large degree, our primary loyalty to be to God. I imagine through the years you've, you've experienced your, your loyalty to God, your primary loyalty. Maybe it's come up against your other loyalties in life, like your loyalty to your spouse. You've lived in a home where there's kind of a mixed loyalty. You know, one person really loves the Lord, another one just either doesn't or just you know, does it doesn't matter, and you've really felt that tension of your loyalty to the Lord and your loyalty to your partner kind of been at odds, and it's been a it's been a tricky walk at times, I imagine. Or maybe you've experienced where your your primary loyalty to the Lord and your your employment, your employer, your job has maybe been um, at odds with one another. In either case, Daniel one through six, it really requires a kind of heroism, a kind of bravery. To say above all else, I'm going to love the Lord. I'm whatever age, whether it's 15, 18, 20, or 80 or 90, Daniel 1 through 6 says, when it comes to your primary loyalty to God, it's a really good thing to be set in your ways. It's a really good thing to esteem him above all else. And he looks well on that. He he is he honors that decision. He blesses. It says not only did Daniel make it through, we've heard two or three times, in the midst of so many different tricky situations, it says Daniel actually prospered. He didn't just make it through the lion's den. He didn't just make it through this really dicey situation where coming to the king and having a lot of bad news at times. It says that he prospered. He went to the top. That if you, if you decide to honor the Lord, he may in fact not just get you through a tough situation. You might find yourself in a position of, incredible honor and esteem. You might get a raise. You might find yourself in very high places just because he honors that decision to be faithful. He honors that decision to be stuck in your ways. Above all else, you know, we've said last week, I said last week, the tricky thing with the book of Daniel, because Daniel kind of comes in and we think that he's the main hero, he's the main protagonist, he's kind of the main character in the story. And what we've tried to wrestle with is the book of Daniel, it certainly is about Daniel, right? But it's really about God. It's about God and how powerful he is. Do you remember the three themes we've looked at? That God is the only God who reveals the truth. God's the only God who can rescue, and God's the only God who rules. And 
has power. This story, the way that it really ends, is meant to illustrate how powerful God is. That as the powers that be hold out the most cruel form of capital punishment, there be, I read several ancient Near Eastern scholars who said there really isn't much of anything that rivals this sort of threat of punishment. When, when an ancient world power you liked to flex its military muscle, liked to flex its power over its subjugated pe peoples, one of the things they would do is they would dev devise the most evil forms of torture to basically say, we're in charge, cross us, and it's the lions, or it's the furnace, or remember with Rome, it's the cross. It was a very strategic and efficient way to show your power over your subjugated peoples. This story is meant to show us how much more powerful God is. He's more powerful than the evil scheming people that are plotting against Daniel. Have you ever, have you ever had anybody plotting and scheming against you and you just felt so helpless? You know, they knew all the right people in all the right places and you just felt like, man, I, I am, I'm, I'm going to the lions. There's just nothing I can do to get out of this situation. You've had a a coworker or an employer, somebody just had it out for you, and they knew all the right people, and they thought this through really well. You know, they they devised a plan, and you were just going down a track by because of their evil intentions, and you just didn't feel like you could stop it. You felt powerless. That's exactly where Daniel was. That's that's a powerful situation to be in. And Daniel six says, God is even more powerful. If you stay loyal to Him, in one way or another, He can He can work it out. He can get you out of the clutches of people and their evil plans to thwart you or get rid of you. I don't know if we've ever had, and if you have, Matt, I'd be curious to talk with you. I don't know if we've ever, have you ever faced a den of lions? I mean, that in itself is a very powerful thing. The way the story is narrated, right, is to illustrate the power. The story is very quiet. I mean, Daniel has very little, there's very little talking from Daniel. Most of the talking is with the king and his officials. You know, Daniel goes and does his normal thing, and he prays, and he's thrown to the lions, and he, there's just very little talking. He's very quiet, quietly obedient, and he goes to the lions, and the king can't sleep, and the emphasis is really on the king. It's not on Daniel. The, there's really very little about Daniel. It's about King Darius. He can't sleep. There's no, no nothing brought to him. He can't. He he runs to the to the den. He's he's uh, scared. Daniel's one his best advisor. And he, you know, he practically yelps. He cries out, Daniel, are you okay? And, and Daniel says, I am, and, and uh, I'm innocent before God and before you. And, you know, the, we're not told exactly. Most children's Bibles have the lions like, like little kitties laying on Daniel's lap, and he's petting their mane. And that really guts the story. These are lions. Have you ever been to the zoo where you've seen those domesticated, wimpy little things? They are. Have you ever heard one of those things roar? Whenever we went to the zoo, have gone to the zoo, and you go near the lions, and there's 10-foot glass, and they roar, have you felt the hair come up on your neck? Mm -hmm. The story tells it in such a way as to illustrate God's power, is that Daniel doesn't even have a scratch on him. This is not a coincidence. This is not just a matter of happenstance. The lions didn't happen to not be hungry that day. It wasn't just a matter of the odds. Because when Daniel's released, and... The perpetrators are thrown in. They don't even touch the ground. It says they, the lions crush them to pieces. Lions are powerful. And yet what this story is trying to tell us is lions are powerful. Darius is powerful. The other leaders are powerful. But God, God can tell a lion to sit down and be quiet and not move till I tell you to. God has so much, so much power. What I love about, what I love about this story is not only just the illustration of God's power, but it's also Daniel's being set in his ways, his being faithful to trust in that power. What we see in Daniel, again, like we saw with the three in Daniel 3, remember that, how they just this was a matter that was settled in their heart. They were set in their ways. This was a decision they didn't make, wait to make when the crisis was hitting. They made it way back here that they decided God was going to be their primary loyalty so that when the crisis hit, the decision had been made. It tends to 
create an inertia in your life, a momentum in your life. Did you notice how it said Daniel prayed three times a day for 60 years? This was not something he just decided to do kind of whenever. God, he had made a decision that God was his primary loyalty. This was a pattern. This was a habit. He wasn't just becoming seasoned in age. He was becoming seasoned in a routine, seasoned in a habit that kept his God and the power of his God very much before his face three times a day. So he wasn't just getting older. He was getting closer. He was becoming more richly intimate, more intimately aware of God's power in his life so that when the crisis hit, and this is what I, I love and what I've been so humbled by, by so many of you in our church family is, when a crisis hits and I'm freaking out, you know what you do? Nothing. It's business as usual. Because you've been here before. You've done this. So what do you do? You do what you've always done. You go about your day, you pray, you put it in God's hands, and you trust for him to figure it out. And that's exactly what Daniel does. He hears that the decree's been set. And what does he do? Business as usual. It says he goes to his room, and he doesn't freak out. It says he prays, and it's a prayer of thanksgiving and of deliverance. It's not like he just goes and prays and says, God, please save me, which I'm sure he prayed. But it says he came before the Lord, and he was grateful. His prayer in a crisis situation was still seasoned and grounded and anchored in gratitude and joy. It was like the prayer he prayed that morning. And that if, he, if the crisis hadn't hit, he'd be praying later that day. When, when you're set in your ways, when it comes to being faithful with God, it takes crisis situations. It doesn't make them not crises, crises, but it takes them and makes them business as usual. It, it has a way of building momentum into your life, so you have something to draw from. You have an, someone you, you'll go to anyway and just say, Lord, I can't get myself out of the clutches, out of the power of the hands of these people. I can't get myself out of the clutches of the lion's teeth. And if it's going to happen, it's going to have to be you. But it happens in the midst of this great momentum, this great inertia that's been accomplished in Daniel's life because he just made a decision, not in the heat of the moment, but 60 years ago to time and time again in a regular fashion. This isn't saying if you don't pray three times a day, you know you're not faithful. He just said, for me to be faithful in Babylon of all places. I'm not in Jerusalem anymore. You know that we're not in Jerusalem, right? We're in Babylon to an extent. We are in exile. The world is not looking kind upon your faith in Christ that if you're going to be loyal to him and faithful to him, you're going to have to kind of set. You're going to have to get set in your ways. You're going to have to decide, if I really want to be loyal to him and if I want to build some inertia into my life so that when the crisis hits, it's business as usual. You're going to have to decide and make that plan long before the crisis hits. Because of that, Daniel's able to draw on the power. He's able to put himself in, in God's hands, who's the only one who really has the power to rescue him. It's pretty easy to acknowledge that Daniel is in many ways kind of a picture, a shadow of Jesus, there's just a lot of parallels. Daniel has evil people in high political places scheming against him. Jesus has evil people in very high places scheming against him. Daniel has a king whose hands are tied. He's trying to get him out of this situation. He, he's had personal contact with Daniel, and he's trying to figure out, he's laboring over how to get Daniel out of this situation. If you've read the gospel accounts, Pilate and Jesus in their conversations, particularly in the book of John, Pilate is trying to figure out a way to get Jesus out of the clutches of the evil plans of his own people. Daniel's thrown to the den of lions and doesn't have a scratch. And here's where the stories diverge. Because Jesus is thrown to the lions, as it were, isn't he? He's not... He doesn't emerge without a scratch. He lets the lion's teeth of death sink deep into his flesh. And he pours out his life to rescue you and 
from me. He quotes Psalm 22 on the cross, which many of you are very aware of, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And right in the immediate context, the psalmist, Psalm 22 says, You will rescue me from the lion's mouth. Jesus is very aware of what Psalm 22 If he can quote it in the greatest crisis of all history, that means he's bleeding scripture. That means he made a decision. It's not just because he was God in the flesh. He made a decision a long time ago to be set in his ways, to get God's word into him so that when the crisis hit, he would bleed scripture. He knows very well that right near that passage of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That right near that, it says that you will save me from the lion's mouth. And yet Jesus knows that if he's going to go to the cross, and if he's really going to pay the price for your and I's sins, then his path and Daniel's path have to diverge. And he's going to have to not be saved from the lion's teeth of death. So that you and I can be. So that we can, like Daniel, emerge from the lion's den without a scratch. Even though we die, we're promised a resurrection that ultimately the lion's teeth of death will not sink into us and have the last word. That's what we need to celebrate today. Is that when we remember Jesus, we're remembering the one who has the ultimate power. So if you've got your communion there, please get it out and let's peel that top layer off to get that bread ready. We're not going to forget to remember, are we? We're going to remember that Jesus is the one who has the most power. And Jesus is the one who submitted himself to the lion's den on the cross. That Jesus let the lions at him to die the most horrific death in our place and for our sins to set us free so that death wouldn't have its last word in our lives. Let's together take the bread and remember who has the most power together. Let's do that together. And let's get that next layer off and get the juice ready. Let's remember the kind of power that doesn't just assert itself, but sacrifices itself out of love, out of joy, out of a willingness to see us through like Daniel. Let's remember the blood that was shed for us together. Are you, uh, are you here and you're young or you're mid-seasoned and you're very set in your ways? If that means that you're faithful to the Lord and you've decided he's going to be the loyalty above all loyalties, praise God. If you're here and you're seasoned and set in your ways, and that doesn't mean that you just, everything's got to be your way, but it means... You've decided long ago, and you've got habits in your life that are set to make sure that God is the remains, the one true loyalty in your life. Praise God. You're in good company with Daniel to remember who's really the one who has the most power. So that when the crisis hits, it's business as usual. Let's pray. God, we know that this story isn't ultimately about Daniel, but we marvel at his faithfulness. We marvel at his just unflinching loyalty. We marvel that while the death penalty is hanging over him, he just goes about his business. He doesn't start a movement or start a raid or start a a march, or he just quietly goes to his room and opens the door and looks toward his homeland, and remembers who's really in charge. He does it with thanksgiving and joy. We want to be like that, God. But we know that that doesn't happen on accident. That wasn't a decision he made at 78. It was a decision he seems to have made at 18. Wherever we're at, God, I pray that you'd help us see that you're the ultimate one. You're the one who deserves our ultimate loyalty. You're the one that has the most power. You're the one who can rescue from the clutches of people and their plans or lions and their teeth. And I pray you'd give us insight, just depending on the season of life, our family, our freedoms, our limits, whatever they are, help us 
help us see what it would look like to be set in our ways, to, to build rhythm into our lives, to read your word, to be around people who have made that same decision so that we can keep you on the throne of our hearts. You're the most powerful one. Thank you for showing us your power as we move forward into the next several chapters of Daniel. God, give us an open mind as we read these apocalyptic visions that you gave to Daniel to help us see the meaning of the messages <laughs> to him 2,600 years ago and what they might mean for us today as we keep our eyes on the throne. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. So may you go out and be set in your ways. And meaning, do what, it need, do what you need to do to make God your primary loyalty. And just decide that is set in stone. That I'm going to make God first and draw on his power, come what may. That's exactly what we see in Daniel's life of faithfulness through three world powers. And Daniel's still there. May you go and be set in your ways to keep God on the throne of your heart. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you so much for coming. Please. Leave